Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Wellbe Show and Podcast. I am thrilled to have a friend and wonderful expert with us today. Maria Marlowe is an author and the host of the Glow Life Podcast and a holistic nutritionist, also known as the Acne Nutritionist. Maria, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me, Adrian. You're so welcome. So I wanted to have you on to help my listeners understand the very common issue, but also depending on the severity of it, the very intense and serious issue of acne. Um, so of course, you know, that's a wide range. Acne can be the occasional pimple um, here and there, or it can be, you know, cystic and pervasive and, and not just on your face, all over your body and really detrimental to your life and um, really like a systemic health issue in your body. So um, Maria is going to share with us everything that she has learned from her personal experience and her work on this topic. So first of all, Maria, what causes acne? Well, the simplest and most direct answer is simply inflammation. And I think this may surprise a lot of people because most people think that acne is caused by bacteria, right? Most of our acne products, whether they're drugstore products or even pharmaceuticals, right? The most commonly prescribed drug for acne is antibiotics. And back in the 50s, it was believed that acne was a bacterial infection. But starting in the 80s, the research, the research started to tell us otherwise. And it started pointing towards inflammation. So this chronic systemic body-wide inflammation. And you know, decades of data started to pile up. And by the early 2000s, acne was reclassified from a bacterial infection to an inflammatory condition. Now, this is a huge paradigm shift in how we understand acne. And this should have caused a paradigm shift in how we treat acne, but it hasn't. We are still treating acne like the 80s and, you know, kind of even the 50s, right, in terms of really relying on antibiotics instead of focusing on reducing inflammation. And in my work, uh, what I've realized and, you know, just going through so, so much research over these years, I find that there's really six key factors. So the chronic inflammation, that's a big one, which can come from eating a pro-inflammatory diet. Uh, also, there's lifestyle factors that contribute to inflammation, like lack of sleep or stress, uh, nutrient deficiencies. There is a lot of documentation on certain nutrient deficiencies being associated with acne. So for example, vitamin A, zinc, omega-3. Uh, we know that gut dysbiosis is also associated with acne and gut dysbiosis contributes to inflammation, right? So there's like a whole chain, everything in our body is connected, right? There's, you know, your skin is not separate from your gut and anything else in your body. Um, hormone imbalance is, is associated with acne. Stress, your thoughts can actually cause your hormones to change in your body to the release of different hormones in your body that cause your skin to um, excrete more sebum it increases your inflammation right uh, and then the last one is uh, overly harsh skincare products which are becoming more and more popular these 10 step skincare is these very strong acids and peels and all these things uh, but for the most part, those first five things I mentioned, inflammation, uh, nutrient deficiencies, gut dysbiosis, hormone imbalance, and stress, these are all are mainly caused by our diet and lifestyle habits. So inflammation causes acne, but I think the most important take takeaway is that you have so much control over your inflammation levels through your diet and lifestyle habits. Yes. And as you were talking about the six things that you'd identified, I was thinking about how connected they all were to one another, right? Because exactly. inflammation contributes to gut dysbiosis and a pro-inflammatory diet um, also is very connected to gut dysbiosis, but also hormonal imbalance, the gut and the hormone connection and the stress, which we can call, you know, mental health, I guess all super connected through the vagus nerve and affects the gut lining and contributes to leaky gut and all these things that I've um, been able to hear about from various like internal medicine and, and gut health experts. And I just can't believe how connected food is, but also the lifestyle things you were talking about to whether or not you have terrible skin, you get your period, you feel mentally well, 
um, you digest your food. I mean, it's all just one, one amazing system, which, which we know. So on the topic of hormones and acne, I sort of get it, but I would love for you to explain it more, but why do certain times of the month or certain periods, especially for women, um, contribute to acne? So, you know, there's sort of premenstrual acne usually, um, and, and, or different times in your life, right? Like there's a lot more acne when you're a teenager and your, your, your hormones are changing or you're just getting your menstrual cycle set. Um, then, you know, other times when you might be 30, 40 years old. Yeah. So there are definitely periods in our life where acne seems to be more common, right? Like you mentioned before a period or during a period, and then also during puberty. And a lot of people make the assumption that because it's so common, it's normal. Like this is a normal part of being a woman. This is normal part of uh, being a teenager and going through puberty. But the reality is it's common but it's not normal. It, it Acne is a sign of inflammation and imbalance within period. And we can, we'll, we'll go through the details of it, but even if we just look at other, um, other communities, other places in the world, other times in history, places where people were consuming a whole unprocessed diet, places uh, where the Western diet didn't uh, you know, invade yet, Acne is pretty much non-existent, you know, even to this day in rural parts of certain parts, like, you know, in a rural part of Egypt where there is no access to processed and packaged foods, the acne rate is incredibly low. Like I read one study, it was like less than 2%. There were other skin issues that people had, but the, the acne rate amongst adolescents was 2%. In the US, it's upwards of 90 to 95%, which is crazy. But then if you look at the acne rate of Egyptians in a major city, city like Alexandria, it's more on par with the American kids, right? It's not as high, but it's like between 30 to 70%. Okay. So people know not everyone who goes through uh, puberty or through who uh, has a period is going to get acne. So let's talk about them separately. First with your period, when you're menstruating, your menstrual cycle or the average menstrual cycle, I should say is about 28 days, right? And there is a certain rhythm that our hormones are going to fluctuate during this time. So the first half of the cycle, estrogen is elevated. The second half of the cycle, progesterone rises. And then right before your period starts, estrogen and progesterone drop, right? And because they've now dropped, your testosterone levels relatively are higher than they usually are the rest of the month. So when you read or ask, you know, why do women break out around this time? The common response is because, oh, um, either because of the, uh, the rise in progesterone or because that relatively higher amount of testosterone. Because we know, for example, with testosterone, high levels of testosterone are associated with um, an increase in sebum production and increased cell turnover. So in other words, high testosterone levels or excess testosterone, it clogs your pores and this leads to breakouts. But we have to ask, all women who are menstruating are going through a similar cycle. Why is it that some people break out and others don't? And I think that comes down to how their body is metabolizing and dealing with those hormones. In my opinion, the women who are breaking out or having you know, PMS and period issues, period breakouts, they're most likely constipated, quite frankly. Uh, they're not releasing their excess hormones. Now, there can be other issues. Maybe their liver is not breaking down the hormones properly. But I would say, what in what I've seen, it's often linked to constipation. Because as you mentioned earlier, our gut health and our hormones are um, really intertwined. So once our body uses a hormone and it's, it's done doing its job, it's sent to the liver to be broken down and packaged up for export and it goes to your gut and it, it leaves our body via our bowel movements. Now, if you're constipated, those hormones are sitting in your gut and they can get reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. And this contributes then to hormonal imbalance and excess hormone levels. But if you're eliminating regularly and you're getting rid of those excess hormones, you shouldn't have a problem. Um, so like I said, also, so maybe it's the constipation or did you have a, I was just going to say, or your liver isn't functioning, right? Like you said, so it's not even getting to the poop that's then leaving 
Exactly. So that that's what I was able to uh, have a regular bowel movement, but like it's almost like that package got left off the truck because your liver exactly. was still dealing with it. You know. Yes. So that that's exactly what I was about to say. So the other issue is your liver. So if your liver is sluggish, we're overloading it with toxins. Um, you know, and and they're everywhere. They're kind of unavoidable in this day and age. Um, but so it's not just overloading our tox our, our liver with toxins, but are we supporting our liver? Are we giving our liver the nutrients that it needs? needs to perform its detoxification processes. Um, yes, the liver is a detox organ, but it also needs certain nutrients in order to perform those functions, right? So we know, for example, cruciferous vegetables are very liver supportive. They help with um, detoxification. We know certain herbs are liver supportive, for example, milk thistle, um, right? So um, the liver could be the issue, the um, constipation could be an issue. And then also I feel like, um, Commonly, there are some nutrient deficiencies associated with PMS as well, because PMS, whether or not you have period breakouts, if you have PMS, like cramps and other issues, uh, there's there's usually some sort of nutri nutrient balance also involved in the mix. Fascinating. Yes, I learned um, recently, which is shocking because it's like, well, you said just because it's common doesn't make it normal. And I am such a cautionary tale of that because my, so one of my few health problems in life was lifelong period cramps um, from when, you know, when I was 12 years old and first got my period and thought it was normal, thought that everybody dealt with them, you know, and they would be debilitating at times, especially in my teenage years and in my college years before I really started to take care of my body better and, and learned a lot about gut health and improved all of that. Um, but one thing I just recently found out was that I had a double genetic mutation on not the main estrogen source, but sort of a side one. And so my body just does not detox out or send, you know, the right amount uh, to the liver or the liver has trouble, you know, getting it out because of this genetic mutation um, or processing it rather. And so, you know, it's not the worst it could be, meaning but if you have the worst one, you might have a condition more like uh, PCOS or something that's much more extreme instead of just period cramps. Um, but it is there. And so it just, for me, it was actually very empowering because I was, first of all, I just love understanding the why behind things. And that's also why I love doing interviews like this, because people should understand the why behind the pimple, not just try to get rid of the pimple each time it comes, but more so that there was an understanding that I, I need to do more than the average person for my liver and for un, like doing things for estrogen, you know, met, met, metabolization, but also estrogen, like not having excess estrogen in my system. I already do a ton as far as that, you know, trying not to have fake estrogens in my products and, and plastics and things like that. But, you know, you, there are detox practices like you were talking about that really support the liver and certain herbs that support the liver and certain types of food, cruciferous vegetables, et cetera. And so some people think genetics are a destiny or a way of kind of being like, well, there's nothing I can do. And for me, it was the opposite. I thought, okay, so I need to do a little bit more and that's fine. I just need to com commit to those things now that I know I need to do more. Um, so everything that you were saying about how the liver takes things out and therefore how it might affect a woman's period, whether that's cramps or skin issues, or at certain times in his or her life when hormones are changing dramatically, right? Puberty mm -hmm. or menopause or something like that. And puberty happens to both men and women. That's why we see acne on, you know, both men and women teenagers. Right. So yeah, it's all, yeah. it's all very, very relevant to me. Yeah. And, and with the puberty, I think it kind of goes back to those six factors. So again, well, like with the period, the hormones, you know, go up and down and sort of a rhythm or a dance with puberty, there are certain hormonal changes that take place. But again, why does almost every teenager in America get acne? But you know, you go to other places in the world and, and they don't, you know, even if we look back through history, uh, for example, the Inuits in Canada, they, um, before they were the, you know, the Canadian government forced them to assimilate into Canadian culture and eat Canadian foods and live in these, these camps. Um, they were subsisting on a traditional diet that was like berries and greens and fish and, um, you know, all whole real foods, a lot of omega-3 in the diet. 
acne was pretty much non-existent. And then once they were forced to assimilate, then, they, you know, and they were eating cereal and, and cookies and, and all the, the foods that American or, you know, Canadian kids were, were eating, their acne rates and their chronic disease rates also started to skyrocket and started to go more in line with, you know, uh, anyone else living a Western style diet, eating these high glycemic foods. So with puberty, I think it also, um, you know, things that we need to think about are in, in, inflammatory foods or any other sources of inflammation. You know, when we think of a teenage diet, it's a lot of packaged processed foods typically. Um, so pro-inflammatory foods, nutrient deficiencies. Um, again, if you're eating mostly processed and packaged foods, you're not eating enough fresh fruits and vegetables, not enough whole foods. You could be missing out on a lot of um, critical nutrients. Um, gut dysbiosis, you know, you can't rule that out because by the time that kids hit puberty in the U.S., it's possible they've been on antibiotics several times, you know, already. And we know that each time we have antibiotics, you know, it's taking a toll on our, our gut mic microbiome. So um, that could be an issue. Um, hormonal imbalance. So again, like that could be that um, constipation issue, right? So if they're not eating enough fiber, not excreting regularly, maybe they're not excreting the, the hormones properly. Maybe it's that liver issue. Um, liver issue, fatty liver disease is becoming more and more common in teenagers and, you know, and, and, and children even. Um, so, you know, there might be issues with the liver. Uh, you know, there's so it's all it's all the same thing. Stress. Kids are stressed out these days. Like we have social media, we have tests, we have school, we have all these things going on. The news, the news in and of itself is terrifying to an adult, let alone yes. a child. Uh, so, so there, it's all the same, the same factors. You know, it's um, uh, that a diet and lifestyle. I feel for the teenagers of today between the diets that do absolutely nothing for them and are harmful, and then. The, the social media and the news cycle and just the level of, I mean, I, the fear of mass shootings alone. I mean, just, there's just so much stress. And I think you understand that food can be very supportive to mental health or not. And so mm -hmm. if you're eating things and not getting proper sleep or having too much blue light exposure or whatever, um, you are going to have a worse stress response in your body to any little thing, right? Because it's not like, Kids didn't have school tests and, you know, bullies a hundred years ago, but they did not have as much inflammation in the diet and it's much uh, blue light, you know, disrupting their sleep. So it just has compounded their ability to, or inability to deal with normal, you know, kid stressors. So that's also, it's just this very insane, vicious circle. But I wanted to ask you too, and I want to like hammer this home because I think sometimes people are very visual or they just need to like understand how something works physically in order to really get it. How do we go from eating pizza, for example, a common inflammatory food, let's say, and have it turn into, you know, acne or puck marks or whatever on their face? How does mm -hmm. that process happen? Yeah, because traditionally we're kind of taught it that everything is separate, right? And exists in its own exactly. little silo. I think a lot of people think you've got this gut system and it's like one track, which it is, and that things yeah. come in and, and leave and that it's really like this. But then they're like very confused by how does something then leave that process and end up on your face? <laughs> yeah, well, I think another... Uh, reason that this this compartmentalization of our, our organs uh, exists is because when we look at Western medicine, there's a doctor for skin, there's a doctor for your gut, there's a doctor for your hormones, right? There's a doctor for your reproductive system. So it's all separated. And, you know, of course, there's different nuance and, and you know, specific things about each system. But it's important to remember, they're all interrelated. And they're all, you know, what happens in one is, is affecting the other. So let's use your example of pizza. Pizza was my favorite food. Uh, when, when I had acne, pizza was my favorite. I think it's food. most people, certainly my <laughs> favorite food, yeah. hands down. Yeah. So, I, and I was, you know, when I say favorite, like I literally ate pizza every single day of my life, probably for years uh, as, as a teen. And so, uh, so what's going on with the, with the pizza? Well, one, uh, let's talk about the gluten, right? The crust uh, that comes from wheat. So one issue 
with, with gluten is that it can lead to something called increased intestinal permeability. So research shows that when we ingest gluten, and it's it, the, the amount of this response really depends on your genetics. Some people are gonna have like a stronger response. Some people are gonna have less of a response. But when we ingest gluten and it goes down into our gut, it causes our body to produce a protein called zonulin. And this zonulin acts kind of like a um, like a little key to open up the door between your uh, the cells that are lining, like your intestinal lining. So your intestinal lining, if you think of it as a tube, the lining is actually just one cell thick. So the way that I like to explain it is um, if you think about a, a single file line of people, right? Um, and they're all, their arms are all linked. So they basically created a human wall, you know, and each, so each person is one cell and where their arms are linked, um, that is the tight junction, right? And so usually that wall is keeping the food and the bacteria and the toxins, it's keeping that in your gut and it's letting things like nutrients pass out into your bloodstream. But what happens when we eat gluten and our body produces zonulin, zonulin like knocks, you know, causes the, those two people or those two cells to unlink for a little while. And now larger particles can pass through your intestinal lining. So uh, toxins, bacteria, these things can go into your bloodstream and they're not supposed to be in your bloodstream. And this creates an inflammatory immune response. So as we mentioned earlier, systemic or body-wide inflammation is believed to be the primary contributing factor to acne. So we get we have inflammation in our body, and then it actually the inflammation goes to our skin. And if you think about like acne, it's inflammation of your skin, right? It's a it's a bump. It's a red raised um, inflammation. So um, so that is one example. When we eat something like gluten, it can lead to increased intestinal permeability that creates inflammation in the body, and then that inflammation can then end up on our skin. So that's one way. Um, you know, if we look at the top of the pizza, the, the cheese, uh, another favorite food of mine, dairy is one of the most well-established acne trigger. There are plenty of studies suggesting that dairy intake is associated with an increased risk of acne. doesn't matter the type of uh, dairy, you know, there's many different forms of dairy, but it, Increased intake of dairy is associated with increased risk of acne. And now, just to, to throw this out there, this doesn't mean every single person that eats dairy will necessarily break out, but in susceptible individuals, which is a large portion of the population, uh, dairy can um, create inflammation and lead to breakouts. So how does that happen? Dairy can be high glycemic, right? It can increase insulin. And when our insulin increases, this that's off this cascade of hormones, which again can kind of turn on those oil spigots in our skin, you know, and sort of prompt those sebaceous glands to produce more oil. And that clogs our pores and that leads to, to breakouts. Got it. Wow. That is so much fabulous information. I feel like I really, the, the people with the arms linked, I, I really hope that resonates for people. It's a great visual depiction of what's happening um, and them sort of separating their uh, arms a bit as they eat that pro-inflammatory food, whether it's gluten or dairy or both or other things that maybe their body is just considering to be inflammatory that maybe somebody else is, that isn't, you know, like soy, some people are okay with, some people really can't handle that. And so there's also a unique aspect to like, what's going to make those guys separate their arms and let bad things pass through into your bloodstream and onto your face. Um, so it's very nuanced, but um, that was a great explanation. Thank you. So along those same lines, we know that food, obviously, from everything you've just said, and the, the state of your gut health play a large role in other skin conditions like eczema and psoriasis, uh, but in different ways. So can you give us a quick explanation on the difference between those skin conditions and how for example, eczema would manifest versus acne? Yeah, so acne, eczema, and psoriasis, these are all considered inflammatory conditions uh, or inflammatory skin conditions. They are all associated with gut dysbiosis. Um, they're all associated with different nutrient deficiencies. So there are a lot of commonalities uh, and it's not uncommon for someone to have more than one of these issues 
because there are a lot of the same root causes. But in terms of why one manifests, you know, like inflammation for me manifests as acne, inflammation for someone else manifests as eczema, let's say, or someone else it's psoriasis, that I don't know if there's a great answer for that, but I would imagine it's some combination of genetics and history and, um, you know, environment and, and all of these, these factors and, and probably more. But uh, another key difference amongst these is that psoriasis, for example, this is considered an autoimmune disease. So this is a bit different than acne and eczema. Their acne and eczema, you know, there's inflammation involved with them, but they're not considered autoimmune. Another interesting thing about psoriasis is that there's a process called angiogenesis that takes place, which is basically your body creates blood vessels that basically um, kind of create those plaques, like those signature red plaques on the body. So that's also, um, you know, uh, a disease of the blood vessels uh, or a condition of the blood vessels, I sh should say. So psoriasis is, yeah, autoimmune, there's um, vasculature in, involved, and that, that's that. Um, eczema is generally believed to be caused by either um, some, some issue with the skin barrier that is causing, you know, transepidermal water loss, uh, so basically letting moisture out, but letting germs in, or um, it could be some sort of like immu immune response to or inflammatory response to some sort of irritant. So if we think of something like seborrheic dermatitis, right, which is like scalp eczema, basically, um, that is uh, believed to be triggered by um, the yeast, the malassezia yeast. So malassezia is actually a, um, it's a common part of the human skin microbiome. Everybody has it, but some people, for some reason, they have uh, an inflammatory response to this to this yeast, and it creates flakes and dandruff and that itchy, flaky skin. So, um, oh, it's so not I, an, it's not an excess of that yeast. It's it's the body's inflammatory response to that yeast in the body. Yes, it could Perfect. you know it could be an excess. Well, well, that's the interesting thing. That's actually a great point that you bring up because malassezia is considered like it's considered a commensal yeast, but when it either grows out of control or in certain genetically predisposed individuals, they have this, I guess, hypersensitive response to it. You don't necessarily want to kill it entirely, but you want to rein it in, you know, and you want to make sure the good guys in that microbiome are um, keeping it in check. A question for you back to acne, Maria, is there such thing as an acne delay? Like how soon after you feel stressed or, you know, eat pizza or whatever it is, do people typically then have it come out on their face? Is it as fast as, you know, a couple of hours later? Is it a day? Is it a week? It's, it seems like if people are going to try to change their diet and lifestyle, they, they first have to understand when it comes and then think back to maybe what they were doing or eating. And so helping to understand the timing, I think is, is useful. Yeah, it really depends because we each have our own metabolism and biochemistry and all of that, right? So the best thing I think that people can do is keep a food and symptom diary and track what you're eating, but also track what's happening with your skin, um, maybe your digestive system, your mood, energy, all of those things, and you can start to draw connections. Typically, once we eat something, it will show up pretty, pretty soon after. So a day, maybe two days probably not going to take a week. It's probably going to be within a day or two for most people. So you just want to, you know, you, if you keep your food diary for one day, like, let's say, th I mean, this is something that I did when, when I had acne and was trying to, to, you know, figure out what was going on. I could see very clearly that when I ate pizza for dinner, I woke up the next morning and I had a, you know, a huge breakout. But when I ate vegetables and wild salmon, that breakout started to go down, started to get less red, the bump started to go down. And after a while of doing this and playing this game of, you know, what breaks me out, what what makes the, you know, makes what makes my skin clear, um, it was it was quite evident actually. Um, and you know, after a couple of weeks, you'll start to pick up these signs and um, and then you can start, you know, you can 
start making changes. And, you know, you mentioned this before that we each also have our own food sensitivity. So there are some food sensitivities that are quite common, like dairy or gluten. A lot of people have these, but you can be sensitive to really any food, um, especially a food that you eat a lot of. So that's why a food diary can be helpful because you may see like your favorite food that you love for whatever reason, every time that you eat it, you have some sort of negative health outcome. Um, so it'll, it'll start, you know, it'll help you to start connecting those dots. Yeah, and you just made me realize, I mean, we just recently put out a well-be guide to elimination diets because over and over and over, we see how incredibly important they are and how they're really the gold standard, according to many, many experts that we know in this field. I mean, the field being gut health and, and for so many diseases to understand food intolerances, sensitivities, all of that more than any, you know, test that you can order. And so we decided it was worth putting a whole guide out there. And I wasn't thinking about the skin aspect. You can 100% do an elimination diet based on just not tracking digestive symptoms, which is of course what most people think of, but just tracking your acne and your skin mm -hmm. um, and seeing, you know, based on certain things that you've taken out and then adding them back in, whether you then get acne. So I think that's really cool. Um, and I hadn't thought about that aspect of doing, you know, tracking. Yeah. I, I even tell people I have a three day uh, meal plan for your skin on my website. It's free. And I tell people take a picture on day zero and then take a picture on day three or day four. And you'll, you'll see the difference, you know, very, very quickly. And in some cases overnight, you can start to see these changes because food is really powerful. I think it's another point to drive home to people because the idea of changing your diet in order to clear your skin can seem like a big step. Like most people would rather just put some cream on their face and call it a day. But the reality is that when you're using topicals and things like that, you're always going to be using them to some extent. Most people are using them for years, but with food, like we think, oh, it's going to take me years for my skin to clear with food. No, it takes days, weeks, months. You know, it, it actually works quite quickly. And people are often really surprised to see just just how quickly they can see a change in their skin. That's awesome and super empowering. My next question was on that topic for people that have had, you know, a long history of acne or very serious cystic acne. Is it something based on your personal experience turning your acne situation around that you always have to manage? Meaning, you know, if you have a couple of days of bad eating for a wedding weekend or something like that, is your face going to flare up with acne or do you really feel like you in the, you know, the process of, of clearing up your acne years ago have really put it behind you. And if you have a bad weekend of eating, you know, maybe you have no acne or one random pimple, but you're not flaring up with acne the way that we think about it now. Yeah. I think anyone can really heal their skin because Acne is not like a bad skin problem. It's it's a habit issue. Like it's an issue of inflammation and it's an issue of imbalance that we have more control over than we realize. It's not going to necessarily be easy. It's going to be hard. Changing your diet and lifestyle is not easy. It takes commitment. It takes time. There will be up and downs. You know, it's not a straight upward trajectory, but you can certainly get yourself to a place where your gut is in a better place, where your inflammation levels are in a better place where your hormones are in a better place, your blood sugar, you know, all of these things, if you can get your body back into balance, then having a slice of pizza or a wedding weekend, you know, where you go crazy or whatever it is, it's not going to impact you as much. Just to give you an example of, you know, in my own experience, if I like back in the day, if I were to have a piece of pizza, I could literally see the next morning it was on my face. You know, <laughs> I had a pizza face. My face was completely broken out. Now that my gut is healed, my hormones are balanced, my inflammation levels are low, I could have a slice of pizza and be totally fine. So your threshold is increased. Now, if I were to eat pizza every day, like I used to, I will break out, you know, and I've, I've tested this out recently in Italy and yes, I will break out at some point, but it, okay, so how many time. days in a row do you have to eat pizza to break out? <laughs> I'd say three. <laughs> I, I think three is a good number for all kinds of things, right? Because like one is could be a one-off, two, you're on your way, three, yeah, you're, yeah. you're doing it. That's yeah. great to know. Okay, so everybody keep that number in mind. One day of bad eating is not going to take you. Uh, well, but you have to do the work first is what you're you saying. You have to do the work first. 
because you know you, you know your your health is a reflection of what you do most of the time not what you do once in a while so if the vast majority of the time you're eating healthy foods if you go off track a little bit once in a while it's really not a big deal and you know you can track like if you want to track things you can totally track things so if you're dealing with acne now you might want to go get your inflammation levels tested you might want to go get your fasting um, insulin levels tested your blood sugar uh, your hormones even you might do a gut test right you can get Get these markers tested and then you can track your progress as well like some people like to see the numbers and they like to see that that difference for some people just seeing it on their skin is enough but you could certainly do that and that might also give you some encouragement um, because like I said you know it's not like your skin's not going to clear overnight it will start to slowly and surely get better your breakouts will start to become less and less you may notice that you used to always break out around your period now now maybe it's just you know half as much as you know, you used to, or eventually like it stops, you know, but in that process, if you were to then retest your blood markers, you may start to see these levels going down or going in the right direction. Um, and that may give you the confidence to keep up with these, these new habits. Amazing. So just circling back, cause we're almost out of time, which is crazy to the six things that you mentioned as the root causes of acne, say somebody goes through their diet and lifestyle and evaluates and realizes that they have they have or are doing all six, right? Like my gut's messed <laughs> up, my diet isn't great. I do have a lot of uncontrolled stress, you know, you name it. I'm not sleeping well or I'm not sleeping enough. Where, because I think it's very hard to do, you know, total lifestyle diet transformation all at once. I, I like to think that you start really focusing on one thing for a couple of weeks only, and then you can sort of like add them back in like a juggler, right? You can't juggle 10 exactly. things at once. You start juggling two or three, and then you got it, and then you throw in the fourth. So what do you think is the best of the six, if you've got them all to start with, to make sure that, you know, you start seeing progress right away, and then you can add in a few of the others? Well, I think that also really depends on the individual, like what is their primary leading factor? Because yes, so some people may have, you know, all of these factors. I know I did. Some people might have one, two or three, uh, but we're going to all have them in different amounts. So like, for example, if your stress level is out of control and like, you know, you're just in a job where you're always on edge and like, you're always working and you're always burnt out and like, you know, like your stress is your biggest factor, then you can eat all the broccoli and, you know, sweet potatoes and whatever wild salmon that you want. Like, you're still going to be in this fight or flight, flight mode and you're not going to be able to heal. We need to get the body into the rest and digest. So for this person, I would say working on your stress is actually the first thing. And then giving that person a strict diet is probably going to stress them out more. So working on stress reduction techniques. Can we try meditation? Can we try breath work, breathing techniques? Like breathing is such an amazing, easy way to kind of shift our body into that parasympathetic nervous system. You know, so that's one example. If um, someone is just like eating a ton of sugar, let's say a lot of refined and processed foods, and that is their main problem, then that's where I would start. We would focus on adding in more of the anti-inflammatory foods and starting to crowd out some of those processed refined foods. Um, and then last thing I'll say, like a good place for a lot of people to start though, is the gut because gut health is so pivotal to our skin health and our overall health. If we're not digesting our food properly, we're not absorbing our nutrients properly. Like, again, it won't matter if we're eating healthy foods because we're not getting all the goodness from what we can. The gut is also a source of inflammation, right? So um, I would say the food in the gut for a lot of people is, is the first place to start removing the inflammatory foods. Um, but again, if you're a person that's under stress, then definitely stress is the first place to start. Got it. I think, right. So you'd sort of go through the six and if one was so alarming, you know, like, well, my diet's okay. And, you know, my uh, stress is, you know, okay, but I'm sleeping like three hours a night because I'm working on a new project. And even if it's not stressful, like it's exciting, but I'm hardly sleeping. You'd be like, whoa, 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 let's take a couple of weeks to sleep first. And then, yeah. start, you know, working on the other things. So that makes sense to me. It's kind of like, where's the biggest fire uh, for that person? <laughs> Exactly. Um, put that out first. So, and I think one thing to be, make sure people understand, because you made the distinction between, you know, food and the gut, the, the health of your gut being like the two biggest, you know, factors in whether or not you have acne, the difference, because a lot of people think your gut health is really what you eat or don't eat, is that a lot of things contribute to the health of your gut 
including medication use, over-the-counter and prescription, the quality and quantity of the water that you drink, other sorts of liquids, obviously food as well, um, environmental pollutants that might be in your home that are then making their way into your lungs and then you know it could also end up in your gut as well. So um, a lot of different things contribute to the gut. I will make a small plug for the free Wellbe Gut Health Guide, which you can download on getwellbe.com to understand the things that really help and harm gut health. Again, like Maria was saying, a large percentage of those things is, is food, um, but there are many more. And so that's also what she was alluding to in the distinction between just food and um, the state of your gut. One more little question I just thought of. As a new mom, I noticed, and a lot of parents uh, will uh, uh, relate to this, baby acne. You know, babies have a lot of random things happening to their skin when they're very little. And, you know, my son didn't have any solids at all or formula really until he was, you know, I think we started, started solids at five months and, and so, you know, a bottle of formula at like the six or seven months state, but he saw he he had plenty of things going on with his skin that looked like baby acne um, from you know a day or two old, and so I never understood what that was because it's not food per se. Um, of course, I eat food and makes breast milk, but do you know anything about why babies get acne and what causes it? So I'm not an expert in this area, and there are people who specialize specifically in pediatric and even infantile acne uh, and nutrition. But for my research, I found that there's basically two types or, of, of baby acne. There's the neonatal acne, which is, say, babies under six weeks or so. Uh, and then there's the, the infantile acne, which is from, say, you know, two, three months to like 16 months, right? For the, the neonatal acne, this is not actually real acne, and this is the more common one. So this apparently affects about 20% of babies um, before the age of six weeks. And um, this is actually caused by that malassezia yeast that we were talking about earlier. So malassezia is, again, it's a commensal um, yeast that is found naturally in the skin microbiome. But for some reason, we don't exactly know why, some babies have an inflammatory immune response to this yeast. And that creates what looks like little pimples on their face. And this generally just resolves on its own. Uh, for the slightly older infants, uh, that is th that affects less than 2%. So that's that's a little bit less common. Um, but we don't really know exactly why it's happening. The common uh, hypothesis is that it has something to do with hormones, um, with excess androgens, whether it's coming from the mother's milk or, you know, maybe just the baby itself. Um, but my guess is there, there may also be some inflammation in there, maybe some gut issues, you know, who knows, maybe even stress, right? Because let's say, I don't know, a baby's doing sleep training or something and is left to cry. Like maybe that's stressing the baby out. I don't know. I'm just, you know, hypothesizing. Yeah. I well, think no, I mean, certainly <laughs> they're getting foods, right? Because if a baby has a dairy sensitivity, the mother can't, the nursing mother can't have dairy, right? So they're getting things in the breast milk that are a result of the foods that the mother eats. So like you said, completely makes sense that if the mother is passing along something that the baby would have an inflammatory response to that it could get acne from it. I think there's not enough awareness about how much the mother's breast milk and what she's eating and consuming and her own hormone levels as she's mm -hmm. then making the breast milk and passing along to the baby affect that baby's skin and um, gut and everything and, yeah. and all of that. Yeah. I mean, certainly eczema, um, but also baby acne. I think most people think it's just kind of just like random harmless thing that happens to babies and they're not thinking about it as, you know, an inflammatory response to something in the breast milk or even to stress from, you know, cry it out method or whatever. I was very yes. lucky to not have to do that with my son, but I'm sure he's been stressed in other ways. I, I think it's not that. I'm not an expert in this area. I don't know. I'm just hypothesizing there's some source of inflammation um, happening there and, and that's probably contributing. Got it. Um, and for another time, you know, the whole concept of things that go away on their own versus you need intervention is also such a mystery, um, especially with babies, um, but also with, you know, adults, you know, like things that just re your body figures out how to resolve on its own. And then others where like you really need to do something different in order to change that 
uh, and make that stop happening. So, well, I love that you said that because that's a perfect example of how resilient our body is. It's always working to bring us back to uh, balance or bring us back to optimal health. And, um, you know, I think that like acne, like this is why I tell people with acne, like it's actually a blessing in disguise because it's alerting you to inflammation inside your body. Not everyone is so lucky, right? Um, a lot of people have inflammation in their body and they don't know until it's too late, until they get a very scary diagnosis or you know something happens to them that's that's a lot worse than a pimple. So um, you know that's not to minimize acne or anything like that, but I think you know realizing that your body is always trying to help you out, you know, and it's always like. Uh, when we have rashes and breakouts of whatever, it's communication. That's all it is. It's communication. There's nothing wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with your body. In fact, your body is probably doing exactly what it needs to do based on whatever inputs you're giving it. I love that you said that. I say that all the time too, about like people with period issues, you know, women are so lucky to have this monthly report card um, to alert them to issues in their body. And so cramps are terrible and mood swings are terrible and this and that, but also so lucky because you get to, to get that communication and do something about it. Men don't have that monthly report card, right? They don't have as many ways through their body to communicate with them that things are not quite right and give them an opportunity to correct, you know, a uh, course correct um, before something more serious happens to, to not to end on a morbid note, but I know somebody <laughs> that I grew up with who just died at the age of 40 40 or 41, um, as you know, as a result of complications with getting COVID, but it was discovered that she had undiagnosed like early stage heart disease. And it wasn't manifesting in a symptom until COVID really, you know, sort of let it take control or let it get, you know, really out of hand. And um, and she passed away. And it was so awful and sad. And I just wish there had been some way for her to get that communication from her body earlier. Maybe she did um, in some way and, and didn't pay attention to it or was trying to work on it a little bit. But um, I think these sources of communication like pain or skin issues or um, digestive issues, not being able to go to the bathroom or you know having diarrhea, these are all ways that we can course correct before more serious things happen. And so having the mindset of not like, you know, acne sucks or like, I hate my skin or whatever, but really embracing like, thank you. Thank you for telling me, let me do something about it um, is such a great way to not only improve your health and your skin, but have just better energy, more positive energy within your, within your body. So uh, Maria, thank you for sharing so much great information on acne. You are a wealth of knowledge. Um, I know that you are doing lots with you know, helping people with acne right now. So please tell the Wellbe audience where they can find you. You guys can find me on mariamarlo.com and Marlo is spelled M-A-R-L-O-W-E. Um, I have my clear skin plan there, which is a program that walks you through uh, 90 days of changing your habits to improve your skin from within, which is actually by the time this is posting being turned into an app. So that's very exciting. Yes, yes. Um, I'm very excited to see it and try it. I'm luckily not dealing with acne, but um, I just want to play around with it. And so I can advise anybody else who is dealing with it, um, how to fix it using your app. So this is great. Very exciting. Thank you again for being on the show and everybody else. Thank you for listening.